Now we're going to talk about a generalization of Fourier series known as Fourier transform. We don't have time to really get into too many details in this course, but I can't leave it out because it is so essential to physics, engineering, really anything. Chances are today you used some device that uses Fourier transform in some way. So I'll tell you the basics of it. And then at the end, I'll give you just one recent application involving physics, which is this black hole image that you may have heard about. In this class, we've been talking about Fourier series. So a Fourier series is a way of writing some function, f of x, as an infinite sum from n equals minus infinity to infinity over sine and cosine functions, which we wrote as e to the i n x. Of course, this is just cosine n x plus i sine n x, so they're both in there. So these c sub n are numbers. It's an infinite set of numbers that reconstructs an entire function f of x by summing it over sines and cosines. And we had a formula for c sub n, which said that the way you get it is you integrate from minus pi to pi, the function you're talking about, e to the minus i n x dx. Now, one thing I didn't mention previously is, you know, we've assumed this interval minus pi to pi, so this function is either only defined on that interval or it's a 2 pi periodic function. But what if you were interested in some other interval? Well, we just picked this for convenience. It's easy to to change everything, wherever you had an n, you change it to an n pi over l. And over here, we have another n, n pi over l. The limits of integration become minus l to plus l. So the length of the interval is 2l. And instead of dividing by the 2 pi, you divide by 2l. So I could have done the whole unit on Fourier series this way. There would have just been more annoying factors of L to keep track of. So the nice thing now, though, is L is a free parameter. And so this is a function which is periodic with period 2L. So Fourier series is somehow restricted to periodic functions. But if the period can be anything you want, well, suppose we have a function that isn't periodic. It looks kind of like some hump. I don't know. Suppose this is our function. Not periodic. But if this is all we care about, if we just extend L out here, we just say, OK, I'm making L here. I'm going to just use Fourier series with this function. Um, we don't care that the Fourier series makes it periodic. We only care about this part of it. And so there's really, the Fourier series can really handle functions that aren't periodic as long as they go to zero fast enough so you can just pretend there's another function that is periodic that's defined in a domain bigger than your original one. So the Fourier transform is where you sort of take this idea to the extreme and you just let L go to infinity. And now we can do a kind of Fourier series analysis for non-periodic functions. But there are some subtleties. And I don't have time to explain the subtleties, but I can make them plausible. The main thing that happens is as the period of the function gets larger and larger and larger, you start to need more and more c sub n's, right? Because you're covering a larger and larger size reason with region with sines and cosines of different frequencies. So you're going to need to fit in more frequencies as the region gets bigger to cover all that information. And in the limit that the region gets very large, all the way to infinity, we get what really should be thought of as a distinct technique, which is the Fourier transform. And the Fourier transform takes any function at all. It doesn't have to be periodic. And instead of a sum over sines and cosines, it represents it as an integral over sines and cosines. And instead of a discrete set of numbers, c sub n, we have a function, c of, and I'm going to call it k instead of n. 
a continuous parameter, and we have e to the i kx, and now instead of summing over n, we are integrating over k. All right, so don't worry about why the n pi over l disappeared. You can do it carefully and all that stuff falls out. For this video, I just want to jump to the answer. So this now is the Fourier transform representation, and the formula for the coefficients gets changed in the same way. Now instead of a set of numbers c sub n, we have a set of, we have a function c of k, where k can be anything, not necessarily an integer. And it turns out what we get is 1 over 2 pi. We're back to that normalization. The range goes from minus infinity to infinity. And now we have the same idea. It's f of x integrated against e to the minus i k x. And we're still integrating over dx. So notice that whereas the Fourier series was a little bit asymmetric, we have a sum up here and an integral down here. The Fourier transform now looks very symmetric. In fact, by a bit of change of conventions, we could put a 1 over root 2 pi here and a 1 over root 2 pi here, and then they'd be almost identical, just the minus sign. And there are, in fact, many different conventions for Fourier transform. This is the one used in the book by Boas. Because they're so symmetric, we think of them as the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform. So it's this function, c of k, which is called the Fourier transform of f of x. So this formula down here is the Fourier transform, and this formula here is the inverse Fourier transform. It's the formula that takes the Fourier transform, c of k, and tells you how to get back the original function f. So what is this good for? Well, it's telling you that you can take any kind of data at all, like a time series from your experiment measuring some quantity, that could be your f of x, and you can quickly figure out sort of how much of each frequency k it has in it. So, you know, one common thing that might happen in the lab is you take a bunch of data, you do the Fourier transform of the data, and you see that this C of k, this function is very big at 60 cycles per second, 60 hertz. And you think, what does that mean about my data? And then you realize, oh, 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 it's the 60 hertz is the frequency of oscillation in alternating current. And so that's just some noise that I don't want in my signal. And so you just make a new C of k, you subtract out that noise, you invert Fourier transform, and now you have a noise-free, well not free, but reduced to noise function f of x that has more of the data you're interested in. So there are many, 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 many such applications in physics, engineering, more generally science of Fourier transform. In this video, I thought I'd tell you just a little bit about how it's used in imaging of black holes. So probably, unless you were living under a rock, you saw this beautiful picture of a black hole, or at least of stuff coming near a black hole produced by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. Let me tell you what you're really looking at. It's not really a picture. It's a kind of reconstructed image from, believe it or not, the Fourier transform. So first of all, I have to tell you how to do this on an image. This is just a function f of x, but it's really quite simple to do it in an image. You just have a 2D Fourier transform. And so the two-dimensional Fourier transform, you basically do it twice. So you would have some function c of, let's call it, k sub x, k sub y, which would be you first Fourier transform with respect to x, and then you Fourier transform with respect to y, or in the other order, or you just write it as a double integral, 2 pi squared, integral minus infinity to infinity dx, integral minus infinity to infinity dy of some function f of xy. Okay, so we're going to think of this as the image. This is how bright each xy pixel is on this image of a black hole. So that's sort of what you're interested in. On the other hand, the way radio interferometry works, 
which is the technique the Event Horizon Telescope uses, is you're actually directly measuring this, the Fourier transform. This is measured by the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. There's a lot to go into here, but the gist of it is the way this uh, measurement works is it has many telescopes all around the world. And here's my world map. I'm not going to try to draw continents, but let's just imagine, I'll draw one, let's just imagine somebody's here in Chile, and maybe another telescope here in Arizona. Arizona was heavily involved in the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. And the distance between these two telescopes um, goes into, you can make some vector, vector from Arizona to Chile. And that vector, we're going to call k equals kx, ky. And by measuring the local electric field at these two points and multiplying it together, that turns out to exactly give you, it measures C of K. And so you get one little piece of the Fourier transform of the image brightness. And then they have telescopes all over the world, and they put them all together, and they get some other pieces of the Fourier transform of the image. And what do they actually show you? Well, they make their best guess for the parts of this they haven't measured, and then they do the inverse Fourier transform. They literally do this kind of integral on their data, the two-dimensional version, and that's what produces the beautiful image that you saw.